Delicious. Hi, I'm Tom Spellman with Dave Wilson Nursery. It's a beautiful early April day here in the San Joaquin Valley. Yesterday we had three quarters of an inch of rain, really desperately needed here in California. We're so happy to have that. It's just a, a, a gift to get that natural clean water on all of our trees. Today we're going to do some thinning. And thinning is something that you need to do sequentially throughout the season, throughout the early season. We want to make sure that we're thinning fairly aggressively, otherwise we get a lot of small fruit instead of some really nice big pieces of fruit. If you're a commercial grower, you would probably be thinning by about 75%, which means three out of four fruit are going to be picked off when they're pea size to nickel size. So the, the other fruit, the more uh, the better quality fruit will have an opportunity to ripen up better and get better size. There's always better money for a commercial farmer in large fruit than there is for a lot of small fruit. So we want to take into consideration the varieties that are going to ripen up first in the season. The variety here next to me is Flavorosa pluot. This is the first pluot to ripen up in our sequence. It ripens up late May into the first couple of weeks of June. And it already has a fair amount of fruit set on it that are fairly good size. There's some, a lot of nickel sized fruit here. In fact, we're getting um, already a little uh, branch breaking here. So thinning can be done in several different ways. You know, thinning can just be done individually where I can just take fruit, look at fruit clusters, um, thin the smaller fruit off by hand. You always want to thin more aggressively out here toward the end of a branch than you do back where it's more supported by its, uh, by its scaffolding stem. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to remove our broken branch. So that's going to lighten it up a little bit. And then I can look at these long wispy branches that have fruit from here all the way out to here. And instead of individually thinning this fruit, I can come in and make a cut. So I can choose to cut right here. So I'm taking off the end of the branch. I'm taking off 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 pieces of fruit just on this one small branch. So that, that lightened it up considerably. Now I can come in and look at these clusters and thin these clusters down a little bit. So I don't want, I don't want 10 fruit all clustered together. Here's you know, five, six fruit together. So always look at the smaller, weaker fruit and that's what you want to take off. So instead of having five or six, I'm going to leave two nice ones. Instead of having three or four here, I'm going to take it off and have two or three nice ones. And I've got a couple out here on the end. So now that branch is lightened up considerably. It's popped back up so that it's not dragging down towards the ground. So same principle here. I can come in and just make a cut and thin. Just make a cut and thin all around here. So I don't have to stand here and individually pick fruit off the tree. It's a long, tedious process to do that individually. And if, and if you like to stand here and pick fruit off your tree when they're pea size or nickel size and spend an hour working on it, I have no problem with that, but I don't have the time to do it. I want to get in here and get it done. So making some of these cuts is going to do most of my thinning for me in just a matter of minutes. A couple of more cuts here, get these branches up off the ground. Now here's a situation that we'll have to deal with a little more dramatically. Here's a, a low hanging branch that has so much fruit, it's just hanging on the ground. You don't want any fruit hanging on the ground. That's the fruit's going to rot and you want to keep that branches uh, skirted up off the ground so you don't have a lot of ant activity going up and down the trees. So I'm going to come back in here. We've got a nice secondary that comes off of this, but I'm going to take this primary all the way out. So there's a nice thinning cut that probably took off uh, 75 fruit or so. So look at all that fruit that was hanging on the ground. So there's no sense in leaving that on. We don't want to see it rot. We don't want to see the branch break. So we'll just eliminate it. Now I know that um, my thinning techniques here seemed harsh. Uh, I'm probably going to get lots of comments of people saying you're taking off too much fruit or you know why are you making all these drastic cuts to thin fruit but thinning is really important. If you want to get good fruit size and good fruit quality you can't have fruit like this on your tree. You want this fruit spaced out so maybe you have one fruit every four or five inches instead of 20, 25 fruit in, in four or five inches. So if you want good quality fruit, get out and thin and thin early. And remember, you can stagger it. You don't have to do all your trees at one time. Look for the varieties that ripen early, thin those first. Come back in a week or two weeks, the varieties that ripen up a month later or two months later, 
then again. And always go back and look at these varieties because I can pretty much guarantee you that when you think you've really thinned a tree thoroughly and you come back and look at it a week later, you'll realize you probably didn't thin enough. So dramatic, yes. Important, exactly. Make sure you thin and thin early. We're here in the persimmon portion of our little orchard and um, we've got a couple varieties here side by side. Some of my favorites. This is um, Nishimirawase, which uh, we call coffee cake. It's uh, an old-fashioned Japanese variety with a cinnamony type texture to it. And it's a variety that requires cross-pollinization. So you have to have a variety that has a lot of male flowers along with it to pollinate the, the female flowers on the Nishimirawase. It's already got a pretty good set. There's some nice fruit set out here on the branches. The, the persimmons flower just as they break dormancy on that brand new wood. So you can see here's where the, where the wood went dormant. Here's where it's starting to flower. So we have our new fruit set right on those little flowers. The companion variety right here next to it is an old-fashioned variety called chocolate. And one of the attributes of chocolate is it's a predominant male bloomer. So it has a lot of male flowers on the tree. So all these little clusters are almost all male flowers. So we have a lot of pollinization for our Nisha Mirawase. You always want to plant these two varieties in combination. If Nisha Mirawase is not cross-pollinated, it will be an astringent fruit and it'll be bright orange in color. So you'll have to use it after, it, uh, after the tree goes dormant, or you have to freeze the fruit before you can use it. But when it is pollinated, when it is plant companion planted with a chocolate, the fruit is that bright, bright cinnamony color and it's absolutely non-astringent and delicious. So we always recommend planting coffee cake or Nishimirawase with a chocolate variety to give it that cross-pollinization. So even though we had three quarters of an inch of rain here yesterday, and it wasn't just rain, it was rain and hail and thunder and lightning. It was a really, really intense storm. We've had a little bit of damage from some of the hail on some of the plants, but we still have to consider even with three quarters of an inch of rain, we're nowhere near where we need to be to be out of this uh, Western drought right now. So probably one of the most important things to consider if you're in the Southwest or in the Western United States this year, considering the, the little amount of water that we've had, is making sure that you irrigate properly. Don't over irrigate. Don't rely on a timer. Don't set your system up where it's a mindless system. A timer is going to come on every day or every other day or every third day, whatever you set it, and it's just going to irrigate mindlessly. It doesn't realize that it rained yesterday. It doesn't realize that, that the ground is already saturated and it doesn't need to water. If you're going to put in a system, Make sure you're using a system that thinks for itself, something that, that uh, works off of a tensiometer that measures the amount of moisture in the soil, or something that's a weather station-based system that uh, re relies on, um, on solid data that, uh, that tells the system how much it should water for that day or whether it should even water at all. So pay close attention to this type of system that you're using. If your system is set up on a timer, be willing to adjust that timer on a regular basis. And again, I can't emphasize enough mulch, mulch, mulch. A good layer of this nice heavy thick mulch, biodiverse different types of wood products, that's going to keep your soil 15 to 20 degrees cooler during the summer months when it's hot. It's going to make better use of your irrigation water, possibly up by up to 50 percent. It's going to increase your bioactivity in your soil, bring back the earthworms and the mycorrhiza and all the beneficial insects and fungi that help trees to feed more efficiently and effectively and, and uptake nutrients and water better. So there really are no setbacks to mulch. There really are no issues to mulch. If you don't want to mulch right up to the trunk of the tree, leave yourself 12 inches or 18 inch circle around the trunk and mulch everything else around that. But in my opinion, in my honest opinion, and I say this in all of my lectures, if you're not willing to mulch and mulch properly, your landscape should be colored rock and pink flamingos. When you're mulching properly, you can grow anything under the right conditions. You can grow anything even in a, in a period of drought just by using proper mulch, proper irrigation management, grow the trees effectively for fruit, for, for foliage, for function, but don't overwater. We absolutely have to conserve water as much as we can. And, and, and that'll probably never change. Uh, even if we get periods of rain, the southwestern United States is not an area that stays wet and moist all the time. It's an area that's dry and arid and gets infrequent rainstorms. So we have to make the best use of the water and, and make sure that we're using all the techniques that we can to grow effectively and respect the situation that we have in California right now. 
In parting, I'd like to make one more comment. I'm getting a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls and a lot of people that are concerned with genetically modified organisms. And everybody's confused on, on what is genetically modified and what is a hybrid. So I just want to assure you that what we are growing at Dave Wilson Nursery is in no way, shape, or form a genetic modification. What we're growing at Dave Wilson Nursery when it comes to pluots, apriums, nectoplums, all of those Zager hybrids that we just absolutely love and promote all the time, these are not genetic modifications. These are varieties that are a result of hybridization where they're taking varieties within the same species. Peach, plum, nectarine, apricot, almond, even cherry, they're all related species in the prunus family. So they can all be grown compatibly together and they can all be cross-pollinated by, by pollinization done in isolation so that you can calculate the varieties that you're working into the cross and, and do those hybrids for an attribute. They're looking for early fruit, they're looking for larger fruit, they're looking for flavors, they're looking for uh, varieties that have the ability to hang on the tree, they're looking for disease resistance. So all of these hybrids are done for a purpose. It's not just, you know, let's cross this and this. It's like, well, this one is going to give us a bigger fruit and this one is going to give us a later ripening season or an early ripening season. So let's put these together. Let's cross pollinate these together by taking the pollen from one, pollinating the flower from another, calculating that cross, planting out the seedlings from that tree, and then looking to see if the results have been achieved. So it takes years. Hybridization does not happen overnight. Almost every Zager variety that's on the market today has taken at least 10, maybe 15 years, some longer, to achieve the right crosses and make sure you have the right combinations that you're looking for before they're released. So a lot of work has gone into this hybridization, but it is in no way, shape, or form a genetic modification. Nothing has been added to these hybrids that wouldn't already have, have happened had the, the plants had an opportunity to overlap in nature. So we're not putting any trout genes or moose genes into your plum trees. It's all within the same family, within the same species. So feel confident that these varieties are safe, they're not genetically modified, they're good quality fruit, and they're absolutely delicious.